So, we're looking at Spider-Man 3 today. Do you remember how excited everyone was for Spider-Man 3? I remember how nobody would shut up about it, probably for one major reason, the black suit. The symbiote storyline has been one of the most famous plots in Spider-Man's comics ever since people first read it back in the 80s. What really got people pumped, though, was Venom. Everyone knew that if the third film in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man film series was tackling the black goose that makes wall crawlers edgy, the character Venom was sure to appear in the movie as well. And you can be sure that in those days, if there was a movie to get excited about, a video game adaption would be coming right alongside it. Treyarch had a pretty big task on their hands here. They had to follow up on Spider-Man 2 and try to build on what they had done before so well, all the while deliver what everyone was looking forward to from the new movie. Oh, did these poor people try. But the game actually suffers from a problem it shares with the film it's based on. There's just too much crammed into it. There's honestly not much else to say, so I guess it's time to jump on in. We begin the game with... Uh, whoa. Hey, hey, wait, guys. Guys, what? Wait, who are you? Wait, where are we? What? Hold it! What in the world is going on here? This is the first thing you see when you boot up the game. No introduction, no warning. Nah, we're just diving headfirst into this building, getting blown up by people we don't know, and Spidey swinging into action to save the day. Waste no time, I guess. Brevity is the soul of wit, as they say. So Bruce Campbell returns to run us through the combat in this really long and drawn out tutorial that we're not allowed to skip because I guess the developers are just confused. Do they want to jump straight into the meat and potatoes of the game or lollygag around all day? What are we doing? Fighting is weird in this this game. The animations are fine, a step up from before to be sure, but it feels like it has the problem from Spider-Man 2 with enemies being really floaty and flying all over the place but dialed up a bit. Still, it's actually not terrible, and the game offers up a pretty wide variety of combos and attacks to pull off. We also have a dodge button again, which kind of slows down time for a bit. This is great for avoiding enemy attacks or just taking in the situation at hand. Yep, that's me your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. You're probably wondering how I got myself into this situation. Well, it all started. You can also counter enemy attacks by pressing an attack button after successfully dodging, and it works well enough. What doesn't work so well is the camera. What in the name of Haruhi Suzumiya is going on with the camera here? It's flying all over the place with every little movement Spider-Man makes like it's afraid he's gonna dissipate into the void and the player's just gonna be left with a blank screen. I just want it to calm down a bit. Dial it back, please. It gets even worse when you jump. See, with this being an open world game and all, Spider-Man needs to be able to travel great distances in a short amount of time, just like in Spider-Man 2, but Spider-Man 3 has many more indoor levels than its predecessor, and this level of mobility does not translate into small confined spaces like this. It can turn into a bit of a headache really quickly. A couple of new mechanics are brought into the mix here. By clicking in the right thumbstick, you can activate your spider sense and see key items, enemies, objectives, stuff like that. This can actually be a helpful tool in finding what the game wants you to be paying attention to instead of spending all all day trying to interact with everything. The second new mechanic is kind of amusing. Oh, that was fun. Welcome, dear friends, to quick time events. These are little segments of the game, usually at a crucial moment of a boss fight or towards the end of a mission, where a cinematic will play and you need to press each button that pops up on the screen. Press all of the buttons correctly and everything is peachy. As a matter of fact, some of these animations look really neat, but if you press the wrong button or miss a prompt, your failures are visualized in what I'm guessing is the game's way of motivating you through shame or laughter. Finally, once Spider-Man is able to rescue everything from the burning building, which still isn't explained to us, he's finally free to explore New York City. Web swinging in Spider-Man 3 is... different. So I'm not entirely sure what went wrong here. I think a part of it is that there's just too much direct control from the player. Instead of Spidey's swings being controlled by gravity and momentum, it's all controlled by the player's input. This can cause some silly circumstances. I will say though, you do get used to it after a while. At a certain point, I'd forgotten all about how weird the web swinging was in this game, and actually found myself enjoying how it worked from time to time. On the city streets, there are, as always, bugs to beat up, civilians to see who all ignore you, even in kind of dire circumstances, I might add, people to save and crimes to stop. These are pretty fun. No more complicated than past games, but not really any more varied either, which is kind of disappointing. There's also races.
But the biggest change here is that you don't really have to go out and stop crimes at all. Story objectives can actually be chosen from the city map at any time as long as you're not already in a mission. Interesting setup. If you enjoy the crime fighting like I do, it's all still there for you. You just don't have to do any of it if all you care about is moving the story along, which comes with its own set of problems, the first of which being the story itself. Peter gives us a quick rundown on the state of his world. He's doing pretty great, actually. He's doing his thing, stopping crimes, the public finally seems to love him, and he's got the girl of his dreams by his side. But in the midst of all of that, something is brewing. Okay, like 10 things are brewing, actually. Let me be clear right now. I am not going to try to tackle the entire story of this game. We will be here all day. There is so much happening in this game, it's ridiculous. There are three gangs running around the city that all need to be stopped, and each one has its own little storyline. Peter's professor, Dr. Connors, has turned himself into a giant lizard while trying to grow back an arm that he had lost and starts going crazy. Scorpion is being mind-controlled by a government agency that's trying to use him as a weapon. The bombers from the beginning of the game are trying to blow up the city. Craven the Hunter shows up to track down the lizard. A detective named Gene DeWolf needs help weeding out some crooked cops, the Kingpin's trying to unite all the gangs against you, and none of that is even mentioning any material that's actually from the movie. Harry has become a new Green Goblin and tries to kill Peter, but is unsuccessful. Peter rushes him to the hospital, and we are not going to see this guy again till the end of the game. Flint Marco is just some guy, I guess, who gets turned into Sandman. Not sure how, and he's not even relevant to Peter like he was in the movie. And some jerk waffle named Eddie Brock is trying to one-up Peter at the Daily Bugle and take over his job. While Peter and Mary Jane are talking one night, this weird ooze that we all recognize at this point as a symbiote crash lands on Earth from a meteor and latches onto Peter's leg. One night, about halfway through the game, once you've completed enough missions, Peter lays on his bed having a nightmare of some kind, and the symbiote attaches itself to him, creating the black suit. Spider-Man's black suit serves two purposes in the game. During gameplay, it actually makes Spider-Man a bit stronger and offers up its own set of combos, but within the story, it has this added effect of stripping Peter of his inhibitions and making him much more aggressive. He starts speaking rudely to people that he was once polite to, comes off way too strongly to his co-workers, and even has the nerve to assass J. Jonah Jameson. Get your feet off my desk! What's the magic word? Ow! During a mission, Spidey notices that loud noises do something to the suit and also might serve as some sort of weakness, but it doesn't really translate into gameplay. I thought it would have been cool if you had to go through an area that made you weak because of the sonic waves in the environment, but eh, what do I know? Eventually, the rivalry Peter and Eddie have hits a high when Brock tries to frame the wall crawler for a crime he didn't commit so he can get Jameson's favor, but the webhead finds out about this and is not really happy about it. Spider-Man destroys the cameras Eddie had set up and the phony vows revenge on the spider because of course he does. What I find kind of interesting is that, again, the black suit doesn't show up until about halfway through the game. I don't know, for something that was marketed so strongly, I would have thought that it would have acted as a more central part of the whole game, but no, it just shows up after a certain period, makes me want to slap Spider-Man upside the head with a train, and then it's gone. You see, after going on another date with Mary Jane, Peter ends up being extremely rude to her and even sort of scary when he's trying to take her back home. She tells him that she just can't see him while he's treating her like this and he needs to figure out what's going wrong with him, and he finally puts together what the suit has been doing to him. He goes to a nearby church and Eddie Brock sees him and decides to follow. Using the church bells to his advantage, he weakens the suit and removes it, but doesn't see that the remains travel down to Brock and overtake him, creating this abomination. I, I mean, Venom. No, wait, I mean abomination, because what in the world is this goofy looking thing? Whoa, <laughs> let's watch your temper here. There's children present. Look at him move! Listen to him talk! I don't think there's a single thing about him that isn't hilariously unsettling. Anyway, Venom finds Sandman and orders him to help him kill Spider-Man or his daughter will pay the price. Does this make more or less sense than what happened in the movie? Because I can't really tell. Mary Jane is kidnapped and the two villains wait for our friendly neighborhood protagonist to arrive. Peter finally has his head straight again now that he doesn't have an evil alien messing with it, but still has some real trouble fighting Sandman and Eddie. Then Harry comes to save him. The game does not explain why this James Franco looking hoverboard boy has a sudden change of heart, but I don't really think I care either. Harry takes down Sandman and Spider-Man tries to fight Venom. Why was this so brutal? Venom is dead. Spider-Man killed him. He doesn't even seem all that choked up about it either. He just grabs Mary Jane, Sandman's daughter is saved, and I don't even know what happened to Harry. And then the credits start rolling and I can finally breathe again. Ugh. 
Look, I get it. The game is just going off the material from the movie, but that doesn't make this story any better. What certainly doesn't help is the obnoxious amount of other missions in the game that this story is just drowning in. So few of them actually connect to one another either, and I can understand the argument that the developers just wanted to make sure that there was plenty to do in the game and that it was full of content. I mean, gamers are constantly asking for that, right? So it should all be seen as a positive. And I agree. Or at least I would if all the content that was there was actually fun to play. The thing is, I can barely even remember half the stuff I did in this game. Spider-Man 3 honestly isn't even all that frustrating, it's just dull. The only storyline that I felt any real investment in was the missions with the Wolf. She's a neat character, and I like how she doesn't even seem to particularly like Spider-Man at first. Let's get something straight. I don't like vigilantes, so you and me, we're not a team. She's working with him because she sees no other option, but by the end of this little plotline, she and the webhead seem to have developed a sort of camaraderie. I think this part of the game is actually pretty well done, and they even managed to make a chasing sequence I didn't hate, mostly because they managed to make it interesting. I almost wish that there was a Spider-Man game focused on something like this. There just aren't many stories about Spider-Man working with the law enforcement directly, and I think there's a lot of potential there. And that's kind of the word of the day here, isn't it? Potential. Spider-Man 3 has a lot of potential that it just doesn't live up to. So many aspects of this game have moments that really shine but otherwise fall flat. Take the presentation for example. A lot of the game is muddled down by bland colors, jakey animations, and character models that really need their white shading redone, but then some parts look great. Spider-Man's character model looks fantastic, and just look at this city. The sense of scale is incredible. New York feels absolutely giant. We can also look at boss battles for an example. A couple of them stand out really nicely with cool ideas or simply fun mechanics. So long, but most of them are just punch sponges that take forever to knock out. When all of my attacks take so little of the health bar off these bosses, I'm just left to wonder why the developers wanted me to feel weak. There is one element that I think is consistently great in this game, the sound design. The voice performances are all fantastic, with the exception of him. The sound effects have kick, the little details like distant police sirens help make the city feel more alive, and then there's the music. This has got to be one of my favorite soundtracks in a Spider-Man game so far. It just captures this wonderfully heroic but also foreboding tone. This game is a disaster in a lot of ways, but the sound team was on point. So guys, I bet you're wondering if I recommend this game. <laughs> You serious? No. No, I don't. This was an ambitious game to be sure, and I'm guessing that because the team was working on new next generation hardware at the time, their expectations for what they were capable of creating was askew. I can respect the developers to the point where I believe that they all did the best they could here, especially when they were forced to finish the game in time to release alongside the movie, but sometimes that just isn't enough. None of that changes the fact that this game is cluttered, dull, and messy. If you want a balanced, well-paced, and fun Spider-Man experience, you're better off playing one of the other Spider-Man games I've recommended in this marathon. As for me, I'm gonna go find the nearest church and try to strip away my experience with Spider-Man 3. So, Spider-Man 3 might not be the worst thing in the world, but it didn't exactly pan out. It's good for a few memes, but I honestly think that's about it. Unfortunately, Treyarch only had one more Spider-Man game left in them. I think they wanted to tackle Venom and the symbiotes one last time. I mean, I'm starting to think we've had enough of that at this point, but luckily, they made something pretty good out of it. So, in the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at Spider-Man Web of Shadows. Thanks again for watching, everyone. See you next mission. Thank you for playing. Would you like to try again?